Oops, there we go, Dave. Sounds like we're good. Thank you. So the other piece in Colorado is case management for what what we call home and community-based services for people who have disabilities and need long-term care to remain in their community have been delivered under two different systems in Colorado. The community-centered board system, which was established, as I mentioned, in 1964 for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and then the single entry point system, which is a group of other Medicaid waivers and services for people with a variety of other disabilities. This uh, case management redesign that is happening right now is also combining those two into a single case management agency. So in Pueblo, um, Colorado Blue Sky has been the community-centered board supporting and providing case management for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and accessing that group of services. And Pueblo County Department of Human Services has been the um, single entry point organization in this county, serving all of those other um, individuals with disabilities in the other waivers, the no, what we call the non-IDD waivers. So that's also happening. And, and um, both of these organizations will now be transferring all of the case management responsibilities to the resource exchange. Any questions about that piece? Yes, ma'am. Some yes and some no. So, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, all the different staffing activities we are going through right now to try and maintain as much consistency as possible. I apologize. I'll repeat the question. The question was, are they going to have the same case manager? Um, and, and as you heard my answer, so we are trying to establish stability to the degree that we can, but not all case managers are going to decide to come join the resource exchange. Yes, ma'am. Do they have the option to join? Because we had a fairly new case manager. She was like six or seven months. Um, I think she got hired in May, but we really liked her and she was actually uh, great, but we're concerned that she won't be brought over. So does anybody that wants to come over, are they going to be hired over there? So we're going through a traditional interview process. We want to bring over as many people as possible because of the, st the um, stability that it would provide for families, the knowledge that those people will bring to the resource exchange, the knowledge that they have of the Pueblo community and the needs that you all have. So we want to bring as many over as possible, but they have to go through an interview process and be offered the position. Now, are we able to put in a recommendation like uh, with us as the family say, hey, we really like this person. So that helps give them a nudge with you guys, because some people are great case managers, but they aren't the great greatest interviewers. And we know that. It's hard for me to say yes to that. I would, we would never not want to hear that recommendation. Absolutely. But I, I can tell you that there are a lot of other things that will go into that decision making as well. But I will emphasize that our goal is to bring as many people over as possible that, that can work in this system. Yep. So, um, we're going to get into all the different activities that we're going to go through, um, and staffing is one of those. Um, so let me let me start with some updates for you guys, and then as you have questions, we'll continue to move through those. Okay. You want to talk a little bit about um, the the staffing? Staffing, building, you know, those kinds of updates. Okay, so um, to answer some of your questions about employment, we did have a hiring fair with CBE staff last week. We had some second round of interviews this week. Um, for anyone who was interested in coming from CBE to the resource exchange. So we're hoping to have a final tally sometime uh, by the end of this week, beginning of next week, to figure out who's coming and who decided not to come over. Yeah, you know, ret retention, um, 
Healthcare policy and financing has appropriated what they called some ARPA funds to help with retention. And so the resource exchange back in December, we applied for some of those ARPA funds to help with, with staff retention. And we did account for those staff, um, not just current staff at the resource exchange, but also staff that we anticipated may come over from Colorado Blue Sky and even from Pueblo County. No. Yep, it's an application process. We have to do the whole reference checks, backgrounds, everything. So it's starting from square one. Right now, the last I heard, they had 21 case managers. But Pueblo County was going to retain all 21 of those individuals. Yes, ma'am. My understanding. So, and you know, they are unionized too. Well, they're not going to become TRE employees. They they will mean. Yep. Hey, Nancy, um, it's been asked that you repeat the questions that are asked in the audience. She, this, uh, um, but she was asking questions about Pueblo County and if the Pueblo County employees were going to come over to the resource exchange. And I explained to her that they are not. Pueblo County is going to maintain their staff and they're going to uh, remain as Pueblo County employees. Yes, yeah, sorry, I was trying not to scream into the mic. <laughs> Hold on. Hi, Nancy. I just have a, a quick question. You guys might get into this a little bit further on in the in the presentation, but will the case managers' roles stay the same within TRE? So the case managers that transition over, will some of those tasks that they currently do stay the same? For example, the 100.2, the RPF, will that be um, continue to be done by that individual case manager or is that done on a group process or how do you guys handle some of those individual case management tasks? That's an excellent question. And you all online heard her ask her question and I hope so because she had her mic. No? Okay. Yes, we heard her. Okay. We heard her. So right now, and we're going to talk about that, Whitfley's going to talk about it. We're going through um, several um, initiatives with Whitfley. They're one of our IT consultants. And so what we're trying to do, like Colleen had mentioned earlier, is figure out a process that not only works for El Paso Park and Tallow, but also including Pueblo County. So we're we're working on those things and actually we're going to request feedback from all of you, um, members, families, community members, um, staff, CBE staff, TRE staff. Uh, we want to get a holistic picture of what works, what doesn't work, what we need to refine, what members and the family and the community is asking for but that's going to be part of our process. So we'll hit on that a little bit more, but that's a great question. Rhonda, did you have a question? Um, yes, I had a question. What will be the role of Colorado Blue Sky, if any, in Pueblo County? Um, you said that they would just be doing services, but what type of services? So Rhonda's asking what CBE's role is Karen, my name's Karen. Oh, sorry, Karen. I, I'm sorry. I was asking what would be the role of Colorado Blue Sky in this community? Will they just be doing uh, services? And if so, what type of services? I can answer that, Nancy. Yes, thank you. So, yes, we will continue to maintain our PASA side, which is a day program and also residential program. 
vocational, the same programs that we are currently running will continue to run. There's a question over here, Shirley. Shirley, over here. So are these the services that are indicated by our service plan card? Will they be in effect that we just got implemented for the 1st of January? So I can answer that question. We are we don't plan on changing or revising anyone's service plan. So if your loved one's service plan started 1-1, that means those services continue to until 1231 of 2024, which we don't have any plans in changing that whatsoever. You, you actually lead that service planning process, you and your loved one, you all tell us what services you want based off needs. So we don't, we're not going to change that at all. And Shirley, Fred had a question. Yeah. Fred. <laughs> yep. Totally understand, Fred. <laughs> and and actually, that was great. Um, and so, Fred, you know, we we did ask that very question because we want to be sure that we don't repeat history. If there's something we we don't know what was done here in Pueblo, so we don't know exactly what's worked and what's not worked. So we want to make sure that we get great data so that we can build a system that works for everybody. And so we don't know what we don't know right now. That's why we're asking those questions. I hope that clears it up because we just don't want to, like I said, repeat history. I guess just following through with his with his question and his answer. So what kind, what are you going to do different to, to see that consistency is happening in these programs and in these case management systems? I've been more disappointed with Blue Sky 
not following through than I have with the actual programs that my son is in. So what kind of uh, reassurance do we have from you and what kind of oversight from you are you going to show that there's going to be a consistent overview? So we have in place what's called program continuous program quality. And so I can t tell you, <laughs> from my point of view, I am a stickler for customer service. I, When I receive a phone call, I don't wait for two days to call someone back. If I can do it then and there, I will do it then and there. I, sorry. Okay. Sorry. And I, I expect if I mirror that type of leadership to my employees and I can do it, then I, my expectation is the same for them. I, I, don't even know how to say that differently, but for me, customer service is a number one. Uh, Dominic has been with that now for close to seven years, and he had a consistent case manager that was wonderful. Well, because of all the crap that was going on with you, Scott, he didn't feel like it was any more in his best interest to be busting his butt for no, uh, I don't know if it's, I have no idea why he left, but it just really bothered me. And now we are just like here or there. They don't turn in the plan. It's two months late and it's already, we're still waiting for the plan to be approved. It's ridiculous. Well, you, you know, I, I can say just going through the, the entire system change, there are a lot of things that are occurring that are kind of prohibiting um, that proactive type of report, uh, approach per se. So when I say that, it's because we have had to start using the state of Colorado, what's called the new care and case management system. Now that system, the bugs are not worked out. And so what used to take a case manager maybe an hour to do is taking them two, three times longer. Then we have what's called the PHE unwind. And so when the public health epidemic ended, during that whole time, people were, members were what we call force passed, meaning they didn't have to turn any documents to the Department of Human Services for their financial eligibility. They didn't have to sign the renewals. They didn't have to submit bank statements. They didn't, they didn't have to do any of that for what, three years? Three, a little over three years. Now that the PHE is lifted, we have to re-educate everybody that when the Department of Human Services sends a packet of information now, you can't just not fill it out because if you don't fill it out by their, dead, their deadline, your services, your Medicaid will be cut off. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And so we not just Colorado Blue Sky, but all case management agencies in the entire state of Colorado are dealing with this now. And so you think about the Department of Human Services. Initially, they have 45 days to approve someone's Medicaid. Well, and that's if they don't have a disability established. So if someone doesn't have SSI, there's an additional step. They then have up to 90 days to approve it. So if you think about it in terms of you staff something three months prior to the end date, if we don't get it in their timed perfectly and DHS can't work, work it timely, we automatically have a break in service. And we are seeing it like a domino effect. It's like Every, so we are desperately, I can tell you, Cherie, she's one of our billing and benefits manager, and we are, we are bombarded with trying to help get people, uh, their Medicaid and long-term Medicaid reestablished because it has, oh, I can't even talk about it. It makes my heart palpitate. <laughs> Again, we 
like the question to be repeated? Yes. We, we can't hear her if you don't get the first it's not working This one's on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. We've been working with the resource exchange and their case management department for probably seven, eight years now. Um, we serve as legal guardians for 75 individuals. And I can tell you if I have a question or a concern about a program or a service plan, I get a I get an answer from Nancy. I get an answer from Laura. They're very, very responsive. And I can tell you that after the years of experience. My specific question has to do with the state SLS funds. So we have gone to that pile of money when people are in crisis for emergency respite dollars until we can get them established in the DD waiver or an SLS waiver, whatever will meet their needs. Where will Pueblo's pot of state SLS funds live? And will those funds be specifically allocated for Pueblo County or will they be put in the pot with the other two counties? You know what, Stephanie, that's a great question. And Colleen, I don't even, I don't think we've come to that point. We, yeah, it's a great question. So what I, what I can tell you is that our contract with healthcare policy and finance has just been amended to now include Pueblo. So it doesn't separate out funds based on county. Um, so, for instance, we've been serving three counties uh, prior to now, and all of our funds come in and get allocated out based on the individuals living in those counties. And so I would assume we would do a similar type of allocation, looking at the number of people in Pueblo, the number of staff needed in Pueblo, and then allocate based on how state SLS and um, family support and services is another good example of how they're allocating dollars for direct services and for service coordination case management to those programs so that it it will sit with Pueblo, but it won't, it, it'll it be different because it's all within the same organization, but yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Lola. I have two girls, but my question is, I had to cancel an appointment for a dental appointment for one of my girls. I submitted all the paperwork to DSS, then, they, they send another letter saying they needed something else. I submitted that. And then I, I made, when her appointment came up, they called me from her insurance saying she didn't have insurance. So I went to DSS. Well, guess what? They say, well, we can't talk to you. You don't have a guardianship. You don't have power of attorney. You don't have. <laughs> so I said, so, so then I guess I'm going to tell you too, then you need to call Blue Sky then. What, what are you calling me for? I mean, I don't know who, where to guide them. I don't know where to go. I've tried on my own. So if we need some kind of paper saying that we can go in there and deal with this, because we've never had to deal with it. This is you, the first year. You you know, I, I think DHS, it is customary for them to ask for guardianship paperwork or power of attorney paperwork. However, you can actually even have your loved one sign a consent to release and it you should make it two way and that way We're you gonna need something yep that way you can talk to dhs and dhs can talk to you okay. but i can tell you in in um el paso park and teller we have a benefits and billing team that we will provide very specific information to you. Um, and I can have Cherie talk about that because we know it's very confusing for families when you get a packet of information from the Department of Human Services and you read through it and one line says you're approved, the next line says you're not approved, then they don't really, it doesn't really explain what you need to submit. And they won't tell you. Yeah. Well, we we do an, the next level of customer service, and we can help families with that. Cherie and her team, they usually outline everything. They're like, you need uh, this bank statement ending in these numbers and this uh, savings account. You need SSI. You need whatever we can see. We let the families know 
these are all the things you need to submit and you need to make sure you sign that redetermination packet if that's what they're needing. So we're more than happy to help with that as well. That, that would help. Did I miss anything? Well, two things. I just wanted to tell the lady back there that you can go to the 10th Judicial District website and they have a guardianship packet. So it is important that you get. Okay, then that might be a different issue. You might have to get them to sign off. <laughs> and Okay. Okay. And they my can't second, hear you. My Thank second uh, question was, so come March 1st, are you all anticipating being overwhelmed with all the clients that you're taking on? Um, my son, we just had our staffing in December from Colorado Blue Sky, and we're just waiting on the um, his service plan and all of that, or the, the, the uh, PAR. Um, and so are you anticipating there being a bottleneck down the road and people are waiting for services? Uh, my son's plan starts on uh, February 1st, and I'm just wondering what's going to happen February 1st as we're waiting for all of this and what will happen for our other families after March 1st. Well, I'm hoping there are no bottlenecks, but <laughs> I can tell you I've set up some weekly meetings with Amy and her team because that's those are the things we really want to avoid. We don't want the light to switch on March 1st. And then we have a thousand people knocking on our door because there's no way we can handle that, that amount of people at once. So I'm really trying to set up a game plan with Amy and her team so that we can hopefully figure out how to continue um, providing you all services without a disruption. And so that March 1st, TRE is not bombarded. Okay, can you tell me what role um, um, or how things might change in terms of, of how a, a client goes into um, and is determined by HRC? My daughter has, has not had an HRC um, review in over three years. Mm -hmm. um, she got dropped down from a six tier to a four tier. And we have, my provider thanked the Lord has just agreed to continue to, to get paid at a tier four, but she honest to God is this tier six. She is a handful. And, and so, it, you know, help, how is that going to change is, or I'm still going to be stuck fighting, trying to get her on a six. So the HRC process is not contingent on a support level. And so I think I'm, I'm connecting the dots in what you're saying. However, what I, I'm assuming happened is that a community safety risk was was completed. And so when a, com a community safety risk is implemented, that means that a person has a right suspension. A right suspension has to go through HRC um, at, for review to make sure that the person understands their rights and that they're, what do they need to do to get those rights back? Um, However, TRE doesn't, we don't designate per se who goes through HRC. It really depends on the individual and what, what that person's needs or assistance needs are. So psychotropic medications, they all have to be reviewed by HRC. Anyone with a rights modification has to go through HRC. Safety control procedure through HRC emergency control procedure through HRC, um, a right suspension, res restrictive uh, intervention, those types of things have to go through HRC. So it really is up to that person and their team to figure that piece out and then make a referral to HRC so that it can be reviewed. Well, we will, we will get that up in, well, those are things. That's what I'm asking because I'm butting, I'm butting my head against the wall. So she's asking 
how TRE will help with the HRC process. So it may be that I, I, I'd have to talk to Amy and her team about that. I'm not sure why the person isn't going through HRC, but I know our process and that when a referral is made to the HRC, we put them on the docket. We ask the provider for their paperwork so that we can send a comprehensive packet to the HRC for review. And then we keep, um, I can say, bugging the providers till we get the appropriate paperwork so that HRC can um, think critically about that suspension or whatever the case may be to make sure that if there are recommendations that need to be made, that they're made and that the end of per the person, you know, you think about taking a person's rights away. Fundamentally, that's something we want to try to avoid because you want to make sure that that person is in the least restrictive environment possible. However, we understand that sometimes that can't happen. So we want to be sure that that person understands their rights and understands what they need to do to get their rights back. I hope that Yeah, I could pass it forward. Um, will there be a physical location in Pueblo or do we have to go up to Colorado Springs if we need to come see somebody in person? We have a physical location here in Pueblo County right now as we speak. We've had one for five years. However, we are looking for a bigger office space. Um, we've pretty much secured one. It, we're looking at the Wells Fargo building uh, right downtown. Uh, we're working out some agree agreements with Pueblo County as we speak, uh, but we hope to have that or a portion of it up and running by March 1st. Uh, where's our current location? 421, what did you North say? Main. North Main. Suite 315. Federal, Federal building. <laughs> Do not take the elevator. <laughs> oh, sorry, Fred. My, uh, it's, it's more of a comment than a question. My, I do respite for my granddaughter and we, we are blue with this blue sky and we couldn't be happier with them. Uh, the only problem we have is we change case managers every five days. I don't know. They go through them like crazy. But the other to answer the lady's question in the back, and I'm not the, I don't work for DSS, but my daughter does. And since all this started, half of the people have left. So my daughter has a hundred caseman loads, plus they just threw 20 more at her. So how are you supposed to answer your phone, get to every person mm -hmm. when she can't, she is such stressed out. She's really seriously mm -hmm. thinking. A lot of them went to different places. Mm -hmm. She's really seriously thinking about quitting, mm -hmm. but you know, you can't, you can call. My daughter calls sometimes and there's an hour and a half, two hours wait. So how are just 10, whatever, case manager is supposed to take care of everybody is what is what my con is because my daughter works there and she's a total mess yep. she's stressed out to be honest with you she's losing her hair that's how bad it's getting but they've gone from i don't know how many case managers down to about 10 and they've thrown extra case managers uh cases on them so they can't take care of everybody not in a, a four-day week so that's just my comment well and that's an excellent point too and i can tell you the members or, or the employees that we have interviewed and spoke with, they have a passion to do a great job. But it is it is really about um, the perfect storm right now. I mean, what your daughter is going through, I think providers are going through that, case managers are going through that, the the. DHS techs are going through that. It's like the perfect storm right now. Everyone is running in 20 million directions. Really, and, and I can tell you, I, I feel this with all my heart and soul that we're doing it to make sure that none of our members fall through the cracks. But 
we're one human being trying to deal with a lot of chaos <laughs> and it it is hard so i appreciate you saying that they don't understand my son is a ces waiver recipient and i guess i wanted to emphasize the importance of waiver services for some families my son is 10. If it weren't for the CES waiver, we wouldn't have access to Medicaid and we would not be able to afford to keep him alive. So when it comes to something as important as a redetermination, it's critical because if he loses Medicaid, we yeah. lose our ability to feed him because we have no enteral supplies or enteral food. Yeah. We have none of his service providers. Yeah. So while I empathize with a lot of the families that are worried about losing services providers, therapies, for some of us, this is the lifeblood yeah. of our family and our children. Yeah. And while I empathize with the people that are trying to manage the cases, our children are our lives and their lives are on the line based on your ability to do your job. Yep. And I know that everybody is stressed out, but some cases are absolutely critical. Yep. And you know, I can tell you in those cases, we have jumped, and I may be jumping through hoops is the wrong word to say, but I'm telling you, when we have a critical case like that, there's nothing we won't do to try to get that fixed. Um, in the past, we've been really successful at that. Now, because of the backlog that DHS is experiencing and the PHE unwind, um, Sometimes we're still able to do that. It just takes us a little while longer. So there's we, still families that yep. are in critical need of care and they're not getting it, yep. whether they're with TRE right now or with CBE. Yep. So, yeah, and I can, I can tell you about some partnerships that we've developed with the Department of Human Services. Oh, okay. Hold on a second, let me finish explaining this. So in El Paso County, I can tell you, we have worked with our county partners continuously starting, we were supposed to start this last week, uh, but their uh, supervisors got really sick, but we're gonna actually have them housed in our building so that we can work through cases together. We're really hoping um, and our partnerships with Pueblo County DHS, um, we're actually working on a subcontract with them so that hopefully we can establish those same um, partnerships as, a, as in El Paso County that we have, that we wanna have in Pueblo and mirror that. Um, we are really hoping, and you know, Pueblo County has been um, very easy to work with they're willing to partner with us and do whatever they need to to help us through this transi transition. So we're very hopeful about that. Um, can you hear me? Is that, yeah. Okay. So my question is kind of waiver related as well. My son, um, he has family support services. Um, he is going to be six in March. Um, so he did the DDI. Um, but my question, I'm, I'm listening to a lot of people talk about they were given information and they know what's going on. Um, they know what's going on starting March 1st. And I guess I don't, I mean, you guys are taking over. I've been sent emails that say, well, tell me what you want to do with the remainder of your money or something's going to happen. I mean, like, is his money disappearing on March 1st? I mean, do I have to start a process over? Where do I submit things to? I mean, I have no information. I didn't even know the name of your company until I walked in here today. Mm -hmm. um, like there's been no information provided to me. I have no idea what's going on. Um, that I, Amy, do you wanna answer her question? So as far as the family support money, we're basically having to do like a year in closeout the end of February. And so all of the money that Blue Sky has for family support stops the end of February. And then it gets reallocated 
to TRE under their contract that starts March 1st. So that's why you received an email asking what you wanted to do with the rest of your allocation so that we could make sure that we gave you the opportunity to use it before we did our closeout on February 29th. So what happened, like, does he still have that remainder of money like starting on March 1st or, I mean, what happens on March 1st then? So the new contract takes effect and we don't have those answers yet because we've asked. And so they're still working that out on how, if it's going to be just March through the end of June on how that works, because the new fiscal year starts July 1st and the new pot of money starts then. So that's an answer that we don't have from the state quite yet. I have a question regarding, you said that the services would not change. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So if someone is now getting their city lift paid for, that will continue to be the same? Correct. All right. What are the benefits of combining all these agencies together? And also, are you working with the current case management? Because I would like to see uh, the timetable on this transition because they have to be in place before you take over, right? Yes, they do. So so we're working through all of that with Pueblo, uh, Colorado Blue Sky as we speak. Um, the services won't change. And I'm sorry, what was the rest of your question? What's schedule for the transition? I mean, you, you've got to have it in place before. So I'd like to know if the uh, if you're working with the case current case managers at each one of these agencies to try to get them to be consistent with the, who they're taking care of right now. Yeah, so we, we've already done the hiring fair with, with Colorado Blue Sky employees. Um, we, we had second interviews this week. This week and or next week, we will have a solidified um, employee roster from Colorado Blue Sky. And then we have to also look, we have current case managers here in Pueblo County already. And so what we have to, what I have to do is look at everyone's caseload, see who, who provides case management to what waiver service to figure that out piece out. We've just not gotten to that point yet because there's we've been working on the building um, documents for healthcare policy and financing during the transition, securing a building, um, town hall meetings. So we're really like in the midst of it, but we will, I promise you, have a solidified plan by March 1st. And so when will when will the uh, services be, I mean, when will we know for sure if our case manager currently is on that list? Well, we are, go our plan and what we have, what we're gonna do is in February, which is just right around the corner, once we work through that, we're gonna send everybody letters and we'll let you know who your current case manager is, their contact, their, their TRE uh, telephone number and their email address. Now, I didn't hear what you said, why you're combining these three agencies together. What is the purpose of that, too? Pauline spoke about that at the beginning when she was talking, talking about conflict-free case management and how the federal government has mandated that each state do this. There has to be a conflict-free case management agency. So right now, as Colleen had previously explained, Colorado Blue Sky, they're a case management agency and a provider agency. So you Sorry. have done this transition in other, in Colorado Springs, you did this transition, bringing different case managements together? Oh yeah, we, we actually went through this in 2019. In 2019, uh, TRE took over what was called um, Rocky Mountain Options for Long-Term Care. They were the single entry point in El Paso County. 
um, for the non-IDD waivers, and we were the case management agency or the CCB for the IDD waivers. And we assumed their contract in 2019. So we've been, th been through this process before. So essentially you're the administrator of this? Of, of the coordinating all this? You're the administrator rather than the actual providing the case managers? I mean- you know, Correct, yeah. yes. Okay, and then, the last thing that I have is you said that the services would not be de denied. So like um, city lift, they're paying for the city lift passes to, for the uh, individuals to get on the bus that will still be provided for them. Yes. Okay. Thank you. It says to the speaker now, I am also unaware of anything happening here. It is, it if it affects me, I thought you were going to take over case management from Blue Sky. I don't know how about all this other stuff people are asking about. And so we, we are taking over the, as a case management agency for Colorado Blue Sky and for Pueblo County. But I wanna be clear, Pueblo County, we're not taking over um, the entire Pueblo County, just long-term care services and supports, them as a single entry point. Everything else, Medicaid, financial eligibility, that will still be done through Pueblo County. We are only going to assume uh, the, the uh, contract requirements of being the case management agency for like the EBD waiver, the mental health waiver, the CLLI waiver, those non-IDD waivers, that's the part we're assuming in, from Pueblo County. Nancy? Yes. We also do case management for the regional center and her um, daughter, I believe, is at the regional center, the lady on the... Oh. Line. Yeah, and so we will be the case management agency for the regional centers as well. Nancy, somebody asked a clarifying question back here about the letter that you're sending out on in February. Is there a specific date that they should expect that letter or just right now, just February? Just somewhere in February. We we actually have to go through a, a an approval process too on everything we send out to members and families. So we have to get the clear from healthcare policy and financing to send those out. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, it's not so much taking over as it is all of us coming into compliance with what the federal government has asked us to do. Some of the wills have been moving on this project for at least a decade. And so it's finally the time that the rubber hits the road as they say, so. It's just a matter of partnerships and coming into compliance. Yeah, and to add on to what Dana said, sorry. You know, it was really, um, this was the last push because the feds pretty much said, if the state of Colorado does not do this, we will not provide funding. So we had, the state of Colorado had to do this. Okay, I, my name is Janine Gonzalez and I'm the CES and CHIRP coordinator, but I also wanted to encourage parents because I'm also a parent with a special needs child who is with Colorado Blue Sky, whose actually service plan goes in effect March 1st, which is hilarious, but um, I want to encourage you, please reach out. And I know um, you'll probably, you're thinking, well, I've reached out to my case manager, continue just continue to do this at this process. It is a very scary process. Yes. Um, because yes, the lady back there with the child with the special needs, I understand that as a medical, having a child with medical fragile autism, I understand that. Um, but I also encourage you just to maybe call when you do find out your case manager, call them up and say, Hey, do you mind coming over for a home visit, you know, for an hour you know, let me talk about my child with you, you know, and um, also I want to just reassure you, like TRE, I know we're doing as an agency, 
um, and I've only been there for a year and a half, but I also worked at Blue Sky as well. Um, but I've been in case management for uh, about 10 years now or so. Um, so I just want to encourage you just to ask those questions, just to sit down with your case manager. Um, we're also getting new regulation, state regulations that, you know, um, that we have no control over and it's people from that are coming down from the state and we are trying very, very hard, um, to manage those needs, to sit down and say, you know what, you're person's not getting services. Let's find out what's going on. Um, for, I know I can't speak for all case managers. Okay. But for myself, I'm very persistent, you know, um, for a CES and chirp coordinator, you have to be, um, because of a lot of our, my kiddos are, are bed bound or, you know, um, so just rest assured that, you know, you guys are not alone and that we are trying really, really hard um, working around the clock. I mean, I, I put in maybe 10 or 11 hours a day, if not more weekends. So just, um, be patient. I know that is a terrible word for, a, you know, a parent with a disability. So, but I just want to reassure you that we are trying, um, the best that we can, but I also encourage you as a parent to, you know, take that extra step. Hey, I'm going to, you know, um, reach out to my case coordinator, whoever it may be, and have a conversation with them. Um, I've met parents at coffee shops, you know, and sat down and say, hey, tell me about your child. Okay, so. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, so hopefully, can you all hear me? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so you said you're doing EBD, the mental health waiver, the traumatic brain injury waiver. So you're doing all of those waivers now with with the resource exchange. And then it sounds like family support is moving over as well. So that's good news to hear. What about early intervention? Early intervention will stay with Colorado Blue Sky. And then I have another question about the timeline. So in this example here, she has a son that's up for redetermination on February 22nd. So she would like to move to the resource exchange now instead of waiting until that bottleneck number of May, March 1st. And I think she's been told that you can't move now we need to wait until march 1st so if we have a circumstance like this where redetermination is coming at the exact same time can parents transfer over early you know i i'm gonna say probably yes but i want to get your information because i am actually working on a game plan janine who just spoke um we have cleared her caseload so we're hoping that February 1st, we can start transitioning some of those individuals over, but there's a few things we're still solidifying, but I do wanna get your information because I don't want your loved one to fall through the crack. And then my last question, I promise. So on new cases, so I'm with the Arca Pueblo and we get all the new cases that come in. Should we be going to Colorado Blue Sky still because Sue is doing a wonderful job trying to get it all working or do we go through TRE's navigation now? How are we looking to do that for new families? So for new families, right now, we would need them to go through Colorado Blue Sky. However, I am talking it, talking with Sue as well because my understanding is there is a wait list that they've gone through intake and eligibility. So I'm really trying to figure out how can we start now getting those people enrolled in in services so that not everyone's knocking on our door March 1st so that we are not everyone's overwhelmed. You know, I, I really want to, we want to start off on the right foot with the Pueblo area. And so, you know, I, I assume that March 1st, we have a thousand people knocking on our door. It's not going to go that well. So uh-huh. Um, says, will TRE continue to have family support events to help bring families together? Uh, Brita, I am not the expert in family support, and we are still working through those family support questions, but I will definitely get you an answer. I'll go back to Kelly. She's our our um um, state general fund manager, and I'll ask her that question for you. 
Another question, can you speak to the training that the state has provided for case managers? Is there any new trainings to prevent turnover and improve services? So Jennifer, there are state provided um, trainings for case managers. We all go through the this same exact training um, through healthcare policy and financing. However, the resource exchange, we have a training director and what we call learning leaders that are going to help us develop a training process here, not only in Pueblo County, but El Paso Park and Teller, so that it works for all the communities. What we're really trying to avoid is turnover as well um, and burnout from our case managers um, and making sure that everyone knows what their responsibilities are. You, you know, I think when we were also talking about the why behind every these agencies having to combine into a case management agency, one of them, the state of Colorado wanted to make sure that there was a continuity in understanding of what case management was, that the quality was there, and that also um, it was less doors for people to have to knock on. So in the world now, SEP and CCB, your loved one could qualify for two or three different waivers. So instead of having to go to Pueblo County, Blue Sky, back to Pueblo County, back to, it's a one-stop kind of shop. Yeah. And yeah, let, let me turn it back over to Colleen so we can kind of talk through some of what's on the, the big screen there in our process improvement plans. So the resource exchange has engaged with a consultant to help us learn from you all and providers and other stakeholders in the community about what you want to see for your system of case management in Pueblo. Um, their name is Whipfley, and I've got some representatives here. One of the projects that they are going to be supporting us with is called the Idea Discovery Project. And this project was done in El Paso Park in Teller County a little over a year ago. Families came together, people in services, providers, and then other community partners to really express what they wanted to see as a case management system. And it has really provided us with a wealth of information in the kinds of systems and processes we're developing. And we wanna do the same for Pueblo. And so we want your engagement in that process. And I want Whitfleet to be able to describe that to you and how you can participate that in that. There will be some surveys and there will be some focus group opportunities for you all to participate in. And I'm wondering who online up, oh, there's Anthony. Hi, Anthony. Can I turn it over to you a little bit to talk about that idea discovery project? Excuse me. Yes, absolutely. And happy, happy to be here with everyone. Can you hear me okay in the room there? Is that all right? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, but I guess just to introduce myself. So hello, everyone. My name is Anthony uh, Shibata, and I am a senior manager here at Whipfleet. Uh, focused really on um, our consulting services. And um, what Colleen just introduced is it's a little bit different approach in how we're starting to to uh, to do the implementations of processes and um, the supporting systems uh, to help, uh, well, in this case, to help our uh, teams work uh, easier with less uh, overhead and repetition and paperwork and everything like that with the community so they can provide more direct services. And so this, this idea journey is the first point of that. And if, if you can th think of it in two different levels, basically the traditional way of approaching any kind of uh, process improvement was to basically say, we want to do it like this. And then we're going to train everybody in how to do it like that. And what we found is is that that uh, forcing process onto individuals wasn't necessarily the most effective. And so um, over the last really, it's been recent, but five to seven years, uh, we've been working with a number of groups, um, just to name drop a little bit, uh, our team's been working with MIT a lot on this to invert that and basically say, we wanna hear from the people that we'll first. 
And so that's the, the individuals that are providing the services, the individuals that are receiving the services, and uh, the uh, partners that interact with them along the way. And, and we do that through a variety of, of different uh, means, um, but they're all uh, pretty straightforward. So interviews and surveys are really our biggest uh, direct driver into this. And we ask you the questions of very, again, how have the services been? What has been good? What has been or could be better? What could be improved? Where have you um, been frustrated? Where have you been just uh, ecstatic about the service that you've been getting? And we pull that all together to find general themes, right? From those themes, and again, this isn't, you know, earth shattering, it's just a different way of going about it. From those themes, we're able to say, these are the, the areas of priority. These are the areas that are uh, less priority. These are the areas that are working. These are the areas that need to be improved, right? And put that all together. And then from there, tackle it with, um, we call it, it's, uh, it's the, the abbreviation is PPT. So people, process, and technology. So we can address that by um, individuals uh, being trained further or uh, maybe doing things a little bit differently. The process, that's really along the business with sense size. Can we can we do things a little bit differently to get a better result? Uh, and the technology, what can we have behind it to help um, achieve those ends? Um, but it really is, it's a, we refer to it as a human-centered design approach, uh, talking with you all first. And that's what that idea journey is all about, is really getting that feedback from you all uh, so that we can put it together and then organize a plan to address it from there. Thank you, Anthony. So what we handed out for you um, is a, a letter kind of briefly explaining this. And you have that little QR code on that letter that you can use, like when you go in a restaurant and they want to give you the menu with that little QR code on the table. You can do that here. You can use your phone camera and it will pull up a link that you can click on to the survey that Anthony was talking about. Or we have paper copies of the survey here as well that you can fill out if you choose. We would love for you to do that before you leave today, if possible, um, so that we get access to those surveys and that information. We tend to get more responses when you do it right now than when you take it home and mail it later. Um, so if you have that ability and you're willing to do that, we would greatly appreciate it and why we wanted to provide you both, both uh, options for doing it, either electronically through that QR code or with the piece of paper that we can collect up here. Do you have questions about that process? Yes, ma'am. Can we can we get a, a microphone? There we go. I heard, do we have questions? Sorry, not about the process. I have another question. Okay, I'll get, I'll get right back to you. Any, any questions about this process? So um, can you go back to the timeline document and scroll um, down just a little bit to keep going and keep going? I guess it's, and one more. Nope. Where's the... All right, that's okay. Um, so the, uh, the process is starting with these surveys. After the surveys um, are returned back into Whitfley, they'll gather all of those results. Then they'll start bringing together small groups of stakeholders. So family members and people in services will be one of those groups. Providers would be one of those groups. Staff who have worked in Pueblo would be one of those groups. Um, and then other community partners um, would be within those groups to learn more, to dig a little bit deeper than the survey has been able to gather so that it can formulate um, some strategies for us as we build out both the organizational structure here in Pueblo, as well as the processes to, to work across the organizations that are all involved, because as you all experience, Colorado's system is quite complex. Um, it is not a simple system for accessing services and supports. And so we want to streamline that to the best of our abilities. And that's part of the intention of this project. Yes. I'll talk really loud. Okay. Uh, there was a question about the process. They said if they can't fill that out, how should they get that to you? The question. So I believe um, if you can't fill it out um, today, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yep. You can take it home and fill it out and you can either mail it back to uh, Amy. You can drop it off here at Colorado Blue Sky. Um, those would be two of the best options. Um, Colleen, folks online are wondering how they get the survey. Yeah. 
that's not the it's it's on the back oh there's one actually you have a oh yeah that's right anthony can you put a link to that survey in the chat i can actually um yes let me get that link and i'll put it in Okay, so I think there was a uh, question in the back. Um, my first question, is there an online portal? So once the transfer does happen, is there an online portal where we can go and see the status of our um, services or information? Uh, a lot of state and federal programs are moving to online portals for that transparency and knowing where you're at. Will you guys have an online portal? That's my first question. So people are going to think I planted you in the audience. Why? So I, I mentioned that we did this idea discovery in El Paso Park and Teller a little over a year ago. And when we did that, the families that came to the table said, we would love to see a portal. If, if I can track my Domino's pizza from when it gets thrown, when it gets put in the oven, exactly. and when it gets on into the delivery car, why can I not track my services for long-term care? So Whipley is currently working with us on building that out. It is not ready. It won't be ready on March 1st, but we will have a portal and it will be a portal where you can go into, you'll have a login as a family member. Um, the it, providers will be able to log in. They'll be able to see their PARs. Um, you can upload documents, uh, things like that. It is the ultimate. It, that may not be fully operational till closer to the fall, but it is coming. It is coming. All right. Yeah, that will definitely I think, be beneficial. We're very excited about it. All right. Since we won't have an online portal, is there contact information for you guys that's provided? I haven't yep. been given anything yep. so far. There will be contact information. That and it's. I made a note, too, because of your previous question. Our next communication out will start to lay out exactly what you can expect and when you can expect it, when you can know who your case manager is, how you know who and who to contact. We will also put a list of that available um, probably through our website too, but we will get you that information prior to March 1st. I just can't give you an exact date yet, but we will be working on that. I, I understand how important that is. All right, I see no one else raising their hand. There, so in our case chatter. manager, uh, excuse me for just one second. There's a little bit of chatter in the back of the room. Does someone need a microphone so that we can all hear your question? Do you guys need a microphone? Anybody? I, I have you got one. it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Oh, yeah. So if our case manager, we do like, because I know not everybody wants their same case manager, but if our case manager does get hired and then if they want us, is it like a college application where two roommates ask for each other, they get each other? <laughs> no, I mean, we're hoping to maintain caseloads similar to what they are now with those who do transition over. So we're not anticipating large changes unless there is a, a particular reason like we are trying to put um, all of the CES cases with a certain number of case uh, case managers or something like that. But we are not anticipating doing a fruit basket turnover kind of situation with cases. We would like to maintain that stability. Yep. Other questions? Yes, ma'am, Kim. Just one minute. We've got to have a microphone. Hi. Um Nothing about leaving, are, but are you the only board in Colorado for, I mean, in Pueblo for management of cases? So we will be the only what's called now a case management agency for long-term care and services in Pueblo. Okay. Yes. Can you pass it to the gentleman in front of you? Yep. I think you could probably hear me. I it's talk. the people online who oh, cannot. Hear me? Yeah. Oh, but you know, we, we've been here over an hour. 
we gave our thoughts to you. You're new. You have two or three weeks or to March 1st where you're going to put your program in effect. Let's have a meeting March 1st so we can then air our complaints and our improvements or ideas. You want ideas? I don't know what your program is. You have improvements? Anything from the past could, could help. But there was good things they did in the past. Absolutely. We want to go from there. But we can. It's like apples and oranges. We don't know where we're going to go until we find out what your program is going to do. Well, and that's a that's a perfect uh, next steps transition for us. So we anticipate holding these kinds of town halls and meetings at least on a monthly basis between now and probably early summer so that we can continue these conversations, talk about what's working, what's not. It would be nice too if Blue Skies them could work with human social services. Boy, they're a pain, excuse me, <laughs> but they're a pain. You know, Colorado's, I've worked in three different states in state systems like this one in Colorado. Colorado's is the most complex I've ever seen, the way it is established and set up. And it just makes it difficult for families to navigate all of the different systems that have to come together to make those services happen. Turnover is a problem in a lot of places, not just here in Pueblo. Yeah. We will also put out other communication in writing. We now have um, also on the resource exchange website, it's um, www.tre.org. You can go to that website and there's a big banner when you first come on about change, change in case management in Colorado. You can click on there and see updates there as well on things that are moving forward with this transition. So we'll post them there as well as communicating directly with you through written communication and then future town halls that we'll get you notice out about. Any final questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you wait for a, can you wait for a, a microphone, please? Thank you. Um, just a quick question on the survey here. It looks like from up to, it's currently asking questions about the current agency that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then on the last page, it just goes into change management. Is that where you come in? Yes. So that's where we'll be working on based on the feedback from this process. We'll start to identify changes that we want to create within Pueblo because you guys want to see that change. And then we'll create a, what we call a change management plan. Is that what okay. you're asking? Well, no, because it's asking specific questions on here. It says like, I understand how I will be impacted by this change. That's hard to tell at this point in time. I would agree. <laughs> I would agree that it's early in the process for you to know how you'll be impacted. Okay. And also, so that's just your part, but up through question number 22, it's all related to our current case manager. Right. Cause we want to learn what, what's already working that we shouldn't change as well as okay. what feedback you have on what could improve it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Yes, sir. First, I apologize for I was a little I was late to the meeting and all of you are from Colorado Springs, right? Uh, uh, there's a few up here from Pueblo from Colorado Blue Sky and then several of us from uh, Colorado Springs and then several from Pueblo. Several of our staff live here in Pueblo. Okay, I'm from Colorado Springs, but I, I have a sister who, who's a client here and with Blue Sky, the, the day program. And this is probably not the place to ask the, the question, but you asked about transition and, and things that you'd like to make it smooth, I'm sure. Absolutely. But what I've seen at the day program, it hasn't been smooth. I know that we picked the uh, Blue Sky uh, program, day program, because of the people that were there. It seems like they changed a lot of people in this transition. People that my sister has always, you know, has always worked with. That's why we picked because of people. Why has they changed so many people there? I, I that's that's 
bothering me. It's bothering a lot of people who, who are going there. And I just, um, I don't know who's part of the Blue Sky Day program, but mm -hmm. a lot of transition. I'm your huckleberry over here. So, <laughs> And you're dressed like a huckleberry. <laughs> How about right, I love that? That's perfect. perfect. You raise a really good question. We have gotten that a lot. We had significant turnover in September, and we have been rebuilding and redesigning those programs ever since. So for those on the outside looking in, it looks quite chaotic. Uh, but if you're in the inside of that, what you're seeing is stronger, more uh, control, well, not control, but better. We needed to train people. We had an issue with training. And so we've had to really get that under control. We had some gaps in our training as well. So we've rewritten a lot of guidelines and a lot of policies and procedures to get everyone doing the same thing in terms of our workers being more consistent. One thing that I really liked about the place and why we picked the day program was because those people had been there for a long time and they were established and the clients knew them. They were established with the clients and, and they, they, you know, they loved them. And uh, there's good people they got rid of. And I don't know what they did with them, but they should put them back or do something because you made a big mistake. I don't care well, about the training stuff. Sure, you made sure. a big mistake. Well, you know, we can't make people work for us. So when people resign, we like to honor that. Sometimes they so don't resign. Do. They're pushed out for make for transition. <laughs> and that's what I've seen. And I, I, I know this is probably not the right place to, to bring this up, but I, I, I sure would like a number where to bring this up and, 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 and find out what's going on. Because what was something is wrong. And I'd like to correct it for a smoother transition because it hasn't been at at the day program. Thank you for that. And they're not gonna be doing our day program, so I can always answer any questions that you have. I'm Dana, I'm the executive director. Yes, ma'am. Let's Just a little feedback from some that aren't here and mainly because of the time that was chosen for this meeting. Yep. A lot of young families three o'clock is the worst time of the day okay. aside from maybe seven 30 in the morning, because if, if they've got kids in school, it's pickup time. And especially for single, single parent households or where both are working, it yep. was impossible for them to come. And I also got a lot of feedback that the zoom link didn't even work. So it wasn't very inclusive this okay. meeting, which is a bummer. And that feedback is critical. So thank you. Um, and we can absolutely vary the time, you know, uh, there's not going to be any perfect time for everyone. So varying it is probably one of our best strategies. Um, and we will actually talk about how we can better manage zoom, because I know for many people attending virtually is the only way they might be able to attend. So we will work to make that more productive for them as well. Thank you all. I know you have really busy lives and schedules. So thank you so much for coming out and, and sharing your uh, thoughts, your feedback, and your questions with us. It is going to continue to be helpful to us to make this transition smooth. So thank you. Yes, if you have finished your survey on paper and you want to leave it here on the table, we will take those with us and we greatly appreciate it. Yeah, 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 yeah.